by J. E. Muddock, The Bell of Doom. Up to a few years ago, when it was accidentally burnt down and never rebuilt, the land being sold for other purposes, there stood a quaint and somewhat peculiarly constructed house near Lymington, on the borders of the New Forest. It was known as Solent View on account of the view it commanded of the Solent. Originally, it must have been constructed at a remote period and probably was a farmhouse, as part of it was timber, the front of this part being crossed by heavy black beams of oak. One of the owners, however, had in more recent times built a wing of white stone. It would have been difficult to have defined to the precise order of architecture to which this wing belonged. But one thing that rendered it conspicuous was a square tower, not unlike an Italian campanile, and to complete the similitude, this tower was provided with an iron bell. The reason for this bell being there, no one could exactly tell. The tradition had it that the builder, with philanthropic motives, had placed it there that it might be rung in foggy weather as a warning to ships in the Solent. But tradition went even further than this, and said that the bell always solemnly tolled by itself whenever any member of the family was about to die. Solent View was certainly desirable as a place of residence, for it was most charmingly situated. Its front windows, and especially the tower, commanded a panoramic view of the Solent and the Isle of Wight, and it was said that on a clear day, and when the sea was rough, Anyone standing on the summit of the tower could see the angry waves breaking in mountains of white foam against the needles. The north side of the house, that is, the side furthest from the Solent, looked on to one of those exquisite glades peculiar to the New Forest. The grounds, of which there were about an acre and a half, were tastefully laid out, the northern side being an orchard. Solent view, seen under almost any aspect, whether in the storms of winter or the golden light of summer, was a charming place and it seemed difficult to associate it with anything but peace and contentment. But there was a dark page in its history, and for long the simple country people in the neighborhood passed it with bated breath and spoke of it with a shudder. At the time the incidents occurred that I shall now relate, the house belonged to and was in the occupation of Mr. Oriel Farnell and his family. This gentleman, who was a widower, had spent thirty years of his life in India as an indigo planner and, having made a fortune, he had returned to his native country to end his days in peace, as he hoped. His family consisted of two grown-up sons and a daughter, Lydia, who was about 21 years of age. Lydia, who had been born in India, was a most charming and amiable girl, and greatly beloved by her father. With the taste of an old Sybarite, Mr. Farnell had created a luxurious home and surrounded himself with every comfort. His household consisted of his own manservant, an Irishman named Michael Caron, who had been in India with him, having formerly been a soldier. Mr. Farnell was very fond of this man, and the man was said to be much attached to his master. In addition, there were a cook, four other female servants, a butler, a coachman and groom, and two gardeners. Mr. Farnell kept a good deal of company, for he was fond of society, and it was very seldom his house was altogether free from visitors. I have already spoken of Lydia Farnell as being a charming girl. She was charming in its widest sense, for in addition to a most amiable and loving disposition, she was exceedingly good-looking, a capital horsewoman, an artist of no mean talent, and highly accomplished. There was no wonder, therefore, that she had many admirers in the neighborhood. The young men round about vied with each other in paying her attention, but she showed not the slightest disposition to favor any one of them. Being his only daughter, Mr. Farnell was by no means anxious that she should marry, for he could not bear the idea of losing her. In fact, the thought that some day she might leave his home was the one thing that seemed to cause him any anxiety, and if ever he ventured to hint at this, she would put her arms round his neck and say, You know, Papa dear, I am never going to leave you. I intend to be an old maid. Then would he answer, No, darling, I don't want you to be an old maid. For one endowed as you are, that seems unnatural, but I am selfish enough to want you to stay with me for a long time yet. It seemed as if his wishes in this respect were to be realized, for out of their many male acquaintances there was not one that she displayed the slightest partiality for. It frequently happens that when a young lady is situated like this, she meets the man she can love under the most unexpected circumstances, and this was to prove the case in the present instance. Lydia's brothers were exceedingly fond of yachting, and they kept a seven-tonner moored in a little crick not far from the house and were in the habit of going out in her in almost all weathers. 
They were expert sailors, but in addition to themselves, they always had an old man-of-war's man with them, a naval pensioner who had been about forty years at sea. And it was said in the neighborhood that the Farnell's Water Witch, that was the name of their yacht, could go anywhere and do anything. One autumn morning they went out for a sail in company with their sister. It was in the beginning of October, and though there was a rawness in the air, and when they started, a white mist on the water, with scarcely any wind, the mist gradually cleared away, the sun came out bright and warm, and a good southeast breeze sprang up, which was fair for either running down or coming up the Solent. Tempted by the fineness of the day, it was decided to run as far as the needles. The wind presently freshened considerably, but as it still blew from the same quarter, they bowled along merrily. By the time they were off Alum Bay, the wind had increased to half a gale, but the water witch was exceptionally well found in every respect and well handled. At some distance ahead of them was another yacht, which they had been watching intently owing to her eccentric movements, which arose from bad management. Suddenly, the man-of-war's man who was at the helm of the water witch exclaimed, "'Blowed if she won't turn the turtle directly if they don't mind what they are doing of.' He alluded, of course, to the strange yacht, and his remark was called forth by the lubberly manner in which the stranger had been allowed to fly round to the wind and heel over to a dangerous angle, so that her sheathing right down to the keel on the weather side flashed in the sunlight. "'I think, Master George, we'll bear down on her and see what they're about,' said the helmsman to one of the brothers who was standing by him. "'All right, Harry,' was the answer. So the water witch was put almost before the wind, the other yacht being to leeward of them." In the course of a few minutes, they had come near enough to make out that painted on her stern was the name Rover. Five minutes later, a passing squall caught both yachts, when, to the horror of all on board the Water Witch, the Rover was seen to capsize, and men were observed struggling in the water. The Farnells at once cut away their life buoys, got ropes ready, and swung their dinghy over. And when they were near enough, the life buoys were thrown overboard, and two of the men who were struggling in the water clutched them. The other men had disappeared and it was, alas, only too certain that they had disappeared forever. The water witch was brought up into the wind until all her sails were shaking. Then the dinghy was lowered, and the two brothers gallantly jumped in and went to the rescue of the drowning men. One was a young man, about five and twenty, the other a youth of fourteen or fifteen. Only after great difficulty and a considerable personal risk did the Farnells succeed in rescuing them. They were then in such an extremely exhausted condition that they could not speak, and consequently could give no particulars of the disaster. No trace of any of the others who had been in the water was observed, so the brothers pulled to the yacht and put the rescued men on board. Fortunately, there was plenty of bedding on board the water witch, together with brandy, and, as Lydia had been busy cooking some luncheon, there was hot water too, for attached to the little cooking stove in the galley was a boiler holding between three and four gallons. A hurried consultation was held as to what was best to be done, and the first idea was to run into Alum Bay. But doubtful of what accommodation they might get there, Lydia said, Let us get home as speedily as possible. The water witch, therefore, was headed for home, and with tender solicitude the two brothers stripped off the wet clothes from the half-drowned men, swathed them in blankets, gave them hot brandy, and did other things necessary under the circumstances. For some time it seemed doubtful whether the youth would recover, and even the young man remained in an exceedingly exhausted condition, so that when the yacht reached her destination they had to be carried ashore and up to the house. Mr. Farnell, who was an exceedingly hospitable man, was much shocked when he heard of the disaster. He at once had the strangers put to bed, then dispatched a messenger on horseback to Lymington for the family doctor, who lost no time in attending. He gave the young Farnells great credit for what they had done, expressing a belief that had they not applied the remedies they did, both the man and the boy would have died. He said it would not be safe for the boy to be removed for two or three days, but the young man would probably be well enough to go away the next day. This, however, proved not to be the case, for a recollection of the disaster so overwhelmed him that he became delirious. From papers and letters found in his pocket, the Farnells learned that his name was Halesworth, and that he was connected with the London firm of Halesworth & Company in Leadenhall Street, and a telegraphic message was at once dispatched to the firm, with the result that as soon after as possible an elderly gentleman arrived. This was Mr. Stephen Halesworth, the young man's father, and by one of those strange coincidences that are constantly happening in real life, he proved to be an East India merchant and knew Mr. Farnell very well by name. 
The young man who had come so near a watery grave was his only son, and the youth was his nephew. Mr. Halesworth, it need scarcely be said, was full of gratitude for what had been done, and stated that his son and nephew had been staying at Ventnor with two young friends, and it turned out that they had hired a yacht and had started off for the Needles, the yacht being in charge of an old fisherman and his son, both of whom, it appeared, were under the influence of liquor, and to this fact was due the capsizing of the yacht. Both the boatmen were drowned as well as the other two young men. It is not necessary to dwell further upon the details of this sad disaster. Very frequently in accidents of this kind, when they are looked at from a philosophical point of view, there seems to be an ordered destiny in them. In the present case, it certainly seemed so. For young Harry Halesworth, who owed his life to the Farnells, was fated to become the lover of Lydia. This did not come about at once, but the accident having brought the two families together, an intimacy sprang up, as it could hardly fail to do. Harry Halesworth had sisters, and they invited Lydia to London, and in return they were invited to Solent View. Harry, if not handsome, had a good deal to recommend him to a woman's notice. At any rate, where Lydia had been indifferent to the sighs and pleading looks of many other young men, she fell under the sway of Harry Halesworth. But it was not until the summer following the accident that anything definite occurred. Harry was a guest at Solent View, and one day while rambling in the new forest with Lydia he declared his love for her and drew from her a confession that she loved him. That evening young Halesworth spoke to Mr. Farnell, who received the communication somewhat coldly, and the next day Mr. Farnell had a conversation with his daughter, and he clearly showed that he had some prejudice against young Halesworth. He could give no reason for this beyond saying that he did not think Harry would make her happy. Perhaps, had he analyzed his feelings, the true reason would have been found to be his dislike to losing the society and companionship of his daughter. A little later, when he saw that his daughter's happiness was involved in this matter, he said he would see Mr. Halesworth Sr. and talk to him, and for that purpose he went up to London. Mr. Halesworth, who bore a high reputation for probity and honor, was candid enough to say that his son had been a little wild, and had been sent to a mercantile house in Spain in the hope that he would settle down. But he had gotten into trouble there with a lady and was obliged to come home, though since then he had improved and gave promise of turning out a good businessman and his father promised to set him up in business should he marry. This information did not tend to remove the prejudice Mr. Farnell had taken against young Halesworth, and on his way home again he resolved to put a stop at once to the courting. But when he saw how greatly attached Lydia was to her lover, he could not make up his mind to do this, and so he allowed the lovemaking to go on uninterruptedly for the next few days, and then, much to his relief, Halesworth took his departure, having to return to London. For some time previous to this, Mr. Farnell had been annoyed about another matter, quite apart from his daughter's lovemaking. The cause of this annoyance he kept to himself, but it was evident that letters he was receiving were troubling him. Whom the letters were from, or what they were about, his family did not know then, and though they asked, he declined to tell them. A fortnight later, he suddenly announced his intention one morning of going to London on some business, as he termed it, though he would not state what the business was, which was very unusual with him. His conduct was so out of the ordinary, and his withholding his affairs from his children so remarkable, that they were much concerned. Lydia wished to go to London with him, but he would not hear of it. In fact, for the first time within her recollection, when she said she would go, he displayed anger toward her. He had changed considerably lately, and from a jovial, genial man he seemed to have become moody and despondent, and his children could not help a feeling of anxiety after he had started on his journey. Two days later, Harry Halesworth came down to Solent View quite unexpectedly. He told Lydia that an irresistible desire to see her had come over him, and he was determined to see her at all hazards. Now his coming during Mr. Farnell's absence was a mere accident, for he did not know that Mr. Farnell was away, and conscious that it might lead to unpleasantness, he wished to cross that evening to the Isle of Wight. The young Farnells, however, would not hear of it, saying that they would put him up and promising him some shooting the next day in the forest. He appealed to Lydia to know what he was to do, and she said stay, and so he stopped. That evening, as these young people sat in the drawing room, engaged in playing whist, they were suddenly startled by boom, 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 three distinct sonorous booms of the iron bell up in the tower. The booms did not follow in quick succession, but there was an interval of several seconds between each. 
It was, in fact, like the tolling of a passing bell. The brothers and sister looked at each other in amazement, perhaps even with some alarm, but Halesworth took little or no notice. To him it had no meaning. It is possible he did not even know there was a bell in the tower. Without speaking, George, the eldest son, rose and rang the drawing-room bell, and when the maid appeared he asked, "'Who is that ringing the tower bell? Do you know, Jane?' The girl looked a little scared as she answered, "'No, sir, I don't know.' George left the room in company with his brother, and they went down to the servants' hall, where they made inquiries, but everyone vowed that he or she had not rung the bell in the tower. Who had, then? That was the question. Consternation was visible on the faces of all the servants who had heard the superstition about the bell tolling before the death of a member of the family. No one could ring the bell from below, and no one could ring it at all without passing through the house. While the younger Farnell went out in the grounds, George told the butler to follow him, and taking a light, he went upstairs, then along a passage, at the end of which was a wooden door that gave entrance to the upper part of the tower. There was no communication between the upper and lower part, the lower part being used as a storehouse. The key of this door was kept hanging on a nail in the wall, and it was hanging there now. George took it down, opened the door, and went up the flight of winding stairs that led to the top of the tower. The butler followed in some trepidation. He was evidently afraid. There was no one in the bell loft, and no sign of anyone having been there. The young man went down again, feeling considerably mystified. During the absence of the brothers, Halesworth naturally asked some questions about the bell, and his sweetheart told him the legend. When the brothers returned to the room, the younger one had been round to the grounds with the gardener and coachman. They deemed it better not to say anything to their sister, and the game of whist was resumed. The next morning, the two brothers and Halesworth started off for a day's shooting, and that afternoon, before they were back, Mr. Farnell came home. He seemed to be much cast down, and his face had a haggard, troubled look. His daughter entreated him to tell her what was the matter, but for the second time in her life he answered her roughly and told her to ask no questions. She was highly alarmed at his changed appearance and unusual manner, and, though she dreaded telling him now about Harry Halesworth being down, she felt that it was her duty to do so. When he heard of it, he flew into a passion and said it must have been a planned thing. Later on, when the shooting party came back, Mr. Farnell addressed Halesworth in passionate language. He accused him of deceit and something worse. He told him to leave the house and never come back any more, and he vowed that he would never sanction Lydia's marriage with him. Halesworth was dumbfounded at this extraordinary reception, and George and his brother seriously thought that their father was suffering from sudden aberration of intellect. As for poor Lydia, she was broken-hearted. Stung by the unjust treatment and the harsh words that had been used to him, Halesworth so far lost command of himself as to speak sharply in return. He resented the accusation of deceit. This seemed to arouse Mr. Farnell still more, and he applied a strong epithet to the young man and accused him again of having taken advantage of his absence to come there. The young Farnells and their sister were indignant that their visitors should be treated in such a way. But what could they do? They remonstrated with their father to no purpose, and then they apologized to Halesworth, who, of course, had no alternative but to go, and go at once. His parting from Lydia was a painful one, because they did not know when they might meet again. "'You must think nothing of this, dear,' she said, as she clung to him with her arms round his neck. "'There's something the matter with Papa. I have never seen him like this before, and I quite think his head has gone wrong.' "'Perhaps it is so, darling,' he answered. "'But unless he requests me to come, you see how impossible it will be for me to visit you again.' "'Oh, Harry,' she cried in alarm, "'you are surely not going to give me up.' You have taught me to love you, and I cannot part from you now. No, he answered, if you don't want to give me up, nothing shall part us. Harry, she said tearfully, you know that I do not want to give you up. I will be true to you for all time. You must not take what my father has said seriously. I really do not think he is responsible for what he said tonight. Something has gone wrong with him, and it must be something very dreadful to produce such a sudden and wonderful change. I am sure all will come right in the end. "'Yes, but when?' asked Harry, with a lover's impatience. "'I hope before very long,' she answered. "'Anyway, darling,' he said, "'you will write to me, will you not?' "'Yes. "'And if I come down clandestinely, you will meet me somewhere?' She hesitated. The question troubled her. She had never in her life deceived her father, 
and so she had to choose between love and duty now, and the struggle was a severe one. I think, dearest, she replied tenderly, that you must for a while be satisfied with my letters. I am quite hopeful I shall soon bring papa to my way of thinking. This answer did not satisfy Hellsworth. It was not calculated to satisfy any ardent young lover, who was smarting from a sense of a wrong done him, and who firmly believed he had been badly treated. Oh, well, if you don't choose to see me, he exclaimed a little sharply, though of course he did not mean it. I think the best thing we can do is to part forever. She was wounded by this reply, and she answered, though equally, of course, she did not mean it. Very well, dear, if that is your wish, let it be so. He had spoken with warmth and anger. She spoke sorrowfully and lovingly. The conversation had passed in the hall, and they were now interrupted by the sudden appearance of Mr. Farnell, who sternly ordered his daughter to bed and said to Hellsworth, You are a scoundrel to be making love to my child after you've been ordered to leave the house. Go at once or I'll have you turned out. Yes, sir, I will go, answered Hellsworth hotly, but you shall not insult me with impunity, and depend upon it, you will regret this night's work. Lydia, who was on the stairs, heard this, and she went to her room almost in hysterics. The butler and a chambermaid also heard it, for they were passing at the time. Hellsworth waited for no further reply. He had said his say and left the house. He walked to Lymington, where he engaged a bed at the hotel. But he could well have done without a bed, for he did not sleep during the whole night. He paced restlessly up and down. He was in a state of excitement. Sorrow at parting from Lydia and indignation at the way he had been treated mingled and he was at a loss how to act. But as the morning dawned, and when he remembered how sharply he had spoken to Lydia, and that he had been forced to leave her before he could ask her forgiveness, he felt disposed not to go from the neighborhood until he had seen her again. Nearly the whole of the next day he lay in bed, and in the evening when darkness fell he went out. He returned to the hotel at eleven o'clock. The landlady happened to meet him in the passage, and she was struck by his white face and his agitated manner. He was not only deadly pale, but was evidently suffering from strong excitement. "'Whatever is the matter with you?' she asked. "'Are you ill?' "'Yes,' he faltered. "'But it's not serious. I will have a little hot brandy and water, and go to bed.' Halesworth drank his brandy at one draft, and taking the candle the landlady offered him, he went up to his bedroom. And at the same time, and within about two hundred yards of his house, Mr. Farnell was lying on his back, on the road dead." He had been killed by a bullet in the brain. Mr. Farnell's body lay in the road for nearly two hours before it was discovered. It would not have been discovered then, but a gamekeeper passing along actually stumbled over it. The man was startled and struck a match to see who it was who was lying there, and then he recognized Mr. Farnell and rushed up to the house to spread the alarm. Mr. Farnell's absence had not up to this time caused any feeling of uneasiness, for he had gone to visit a neighbor about a mile and a half away, and whenever he went there, which he did every Thursday night to have a rubber at whist, of which he was very fond, it was late before he came back. His sons and daughter had gone to bed, and so had most of the servants, but the butler was still up. He invariably sat up when his master was out. He went to the door when the bell was rung, and instead of seeing his master as he expected, he saw the gamekeeper who was agitated and excited, and whose face was as white as a ghost's. "'Hello, what's the matter?' exclaimed the butler. "'My God, something awful!' stammered the man huskily. "'The master's lying dead there in the road!' The butler turned as pale as the gamekeeper now, and reeled with the sudden shock the abrupt announcement caused him. "'Dead!' he gasped. "'Aye, he's been shot! Are you sure?' "'Sure, there's no mistake about it. I tumbled over his body.' The butler seemed stunned, but when he went to Michael Caron's room and knocked at the door, Michael opened it instantly, and strangely enough, he was dressed. "'What's the matter?' he asked. "'Come with me,' gasped the butler. "'The master's been shot.' Michael made no reply, but followed the butler downstairs. Then they put on their hats, took stout oaken sticks from the stick rack, and went with the gamekeeper out into the darkness. It was an exceptionally dark night, and in their excitement they had forgotten a lantern, so Michael went back for one. Thus provided, they walked rapidly along the road. The night wind moaned weirdly among the trees, and the hoarse murmur of the sea could be heard. The men soon came to where the body was lying, and it needed no professional man to assure them that Mr. Farnell was stone dead. He was lying partly on his side, with one leg doubled up underneath him, one hand across his chest, and the other stretched at full length. The fingers of that hand were tightly clenched and were full of dirt, 
indicating that after he had been shot, he had struggled a little. The butler was greatly affected, for he had been many years in Mr. Farnell's service. Still, he had the presence of mind enough to notice the exact position of the body with the details I have mentioned. That done, he sent the gamekeeper off to Lymington for the doctor. Not that a doctor could be of any service, but it seemed the proper thing to do. But before starting, the gamekeeper said, I wonder who has done this. There's only one man I know of likely to do it, returned the butler, and that man is Harry Hillsworth, who has been courting Miss Lydia. Good heavens, you don't say so, cried the gamekeeper. Yes, I do. He quarreled with the master last night, and I heard him threaten him, and it's him that's done it, sure as we're here. Then I'd best tell the police, the gamekeeper replied. Yes, certainly. The gamekeeper went off on his mission, and then Michael and the butler carried the body to the house, not without some difficulty. That done, the butler went upstairs and aroused the sons. They were terribly shocked, as may be imagined, when they heard the news. Between five and six, the doctor and the inspector of police arrived. The former proceeded at once to an examination of the body, the latter to making such inquiries as were necessary in a case of this kind. The doctor reported that death had resulted from a gunshot wound in the head, and that death had ensued within half an hour of the wound being made. He succeeded in extracting the bullet. It was a round bullet, and had been fired from a smooth-bore gun. The inquiries of the inspector of police led him irresistibly to the conclusion that suspicion pointed very strongly indeed to Harry Halesworth as the culprit, and he hurried off to ascertain the whereabouts of that young man. It was not until nearly nine o'clock in the morning that Lydia was informed by her younger brother of the father's death. She became almost frantic when she heard the news. Then she reminded her brother about the mysterious ringing of the bell in the tower the night before the murder. There was mystery there, which neither he nor she attempted to explain. The news of the murder soon spread and caused immense excitement in the district, for Mr. Farnell was widely known and universally respected. Before the afternoon had come, the arrest of Harry Halesworth had been effected. He was arrested at the hotel in Lymington and was in bed when the police went to the house. For the greater part of the night he had lain awake and had only fallen asleep about eight o'clock. To those behind the scenes it seemed as if there never had been a clearer case of circumstantial evidence. The prisoner had been ordered from the house by Mr. Farnell and had been heard by the butler and a chambermaid to utter what was construed into a threat. The exact words as repeated by the butler, on whom they seemed to have made a deep impression, were, You shall not insult me with impunity, and depend upon it you will rue this night's work. Then, the landlady of the hotel where he stayed said that he was very excited when he first went there. He lay in bed nearly the whole of the next day and went out as darkness fell. It was between eleven and twelve when he returned to the hotel. His landlady was struck then by his white face and agitation, and she asked him if he was ill. He answered that he was, but not seriously, and then he drank some brandy and water at a draft and went upstairs. These details, as told by the landlady, left little doubt in the minds of those who heard them that the prisoner had murdered Mr. Farnell, and the energies of the police were directed to discovering the gun from which the fatal bullet had been fired. The news of her lover's arrest fell heavily indeed upon Lydia. It was a double blow beneath which she almost sank. And, as she remembered his rough words to her at their last parting, and his apparent menace to her father, she could not help thinking that he was guilty and yet it broke her heart to think so. The death of her father, and the arrest of her lover on a charge of being the murderer, so overwhelmed Lydia, that she became utterly prostrated, and in a few hours it was painfully evident she had lost her reason. It was therefore deemed advisable by her friends to remove her, and place her under the care of some relatives in Southampton. All the circumstances of the case were so remarkable, and in some respects romantic, that it aroused unusual interest. Of course, the mysterious tolling of the bell the night before the crime soon became known, for servants will gossip, and this served to add a new element of mystery to what was already mysterious enough, for to most people it really seemed as if that affair was utterly incapable of explanation. The superstition about the ringing of the bell just before the death of a member of the family was a faith with the simple country folk in the neighborhood, and though they had had no evidence before that tended to confirm the belief, here at last was testimony that no one in his senses could deny. The body of Mr. Farnell was duly committed to the grave, and on that once happy home fell the heavy shadows of a never-ending sorrow. Not for a long time had a crime excited such universal interest throughout the country as this had done. The position of the parties, 
the fact that the suspected person had been the lover of the daughter of the deceased man, and that she herself had become demented, as well as that mystery about the bell, invested the crime with a glamour of weirdness and romance that rendered it peculiarly conspicuous. The papers made capital out of it, and people journeyed from long distances simply to satisfy their morbid curiosity by gazing on the house and staring up at the tower where hung the bell that was supposed to have been rung by ghostly hands. After the funeral, George and his brother felt that the place had become hateful to them, and they went to London as soon as they could get away, leaving the house in charge of the servants and the police. The preliminary inquiries before the magistrates elicited little or nothing that was new against the accused. His friends were distracted, and employed one of the most eminent barristers in London to defend him. At first, Halesworth seemed so dazed by the charge brought against him as to be unable to comprehend what was passing. But he quickly recovered, and then protested his innocence. All the evidence the police were able to get together formed what would have been a chain strong enough to hang any man, had it not been that one and an important link was missing. That missing link was the gun. Could they have traced possession of the gun to the prisoner, the evidence would have been overwhelming, but they could not do so. It was proved that on the day of the murder, the prisoner and the two young Farnells had been out shooting. Each carried a gun, but it was of a totally different caliber to that from which the bullet found in the dead man's brain had been fired. Then George Farnell swore that when they returned from the shooting expedition, he took the guns himself and placed them in the gun room, a small room where they kept their guns, fishing tackle, sails, and other things of a like kind. This room was invariably kept locked, and only he and his brother had keys. Besides, there was not a gun in the house that would fit the bullet. Then again, no gun was missing so that, assuming the possibility that the accused had used one of the guns belonging to the Farnells, he must have taken it back again, and that certainly seemed too ridiculous to be entertained by sensible men. He could not have bought a gun in Lymington without it being known. Where, then, did it come from? Mr. Farnell had certainly been shot. The bullet that killed him had certainly been fired from a gun, for experts swore that the pistol was not in existence that would take it, it was so large. It had, in fact, been fired from a very old-fashioned, smooth-bore gun of a caliber which was no longer made. This imparted a new element of mystery to the case, and people asked, where's the gun? The woods, lanes, and ditches were searched for miles around, but without result, and the solent was even dragged, but the gun was not forthcoming, and the police were baffled. But notwithstanding this missing link, the magistrates who held the inquiry returned a verdict of willful murder against Harry Hellsworth, and he was duly committed for trial, which would take place at Southampton during the Assizes. During all this dreadful time, Lydia was in a condition of mind which prevented her knowing anything of what was happening. As is frequently, if not always the case, where dementia results from a sudden shock, her memory was an entire blank as to the past, and her friends said, sorrowfully, that under the circumstances it was a blessing that she had been so afflicted. The accused, who knew nothing of Lydia's condition, was in a state of prostration himself, but to everyone with whom he came in contact he vowed solemnly that he was innocent, while his poor father and mother and sisters declared that he was incapable of such a dastardly deed. Of course this proved nothing. People charged with murder usually do declare themselves innocent, and their near relations will never bring themselves to believe in their guilt until confession places it beyond doubt. But in the present instance, the unfortunate Houseworths found numerous sympathizers, and many people believed as they did. It was such a terrible blow for a family situated as they were. Their high respectability, their social position, naturally made them objects of unusual interest, as well as of commiseration, in the awful misfortune that had overtaken them. After the magisterial inquiry had closed, Mr. Halesworth, who had been present, went to Solent View by request of the sons. They were all cast down, as may be imagined, but Mr. Halesworth was almost distracted, and in a burst of grief he exclaimed, My God, my God, this dreadful affair will kill me! But willingly would I die now if I could be assured of my poor boy's innocence. Then, to George Farnell, he said appealingly, George, what is your opinion? Do you believe my unhappy son is guilty of your father's death? George hesitated for some time. Then he made answer thus, I confess that I am puzzled. Sometimes I think he is, and at others I cannot bring myself to think so. Many circumstances point to him as my father's murderer, but there are others again that do not seem reconcilable with that conclusion. Then George said Halesworth solemnly and hoarsely, as if his emotion was choking him. 
if you have the shadow of a shade of doubt of Harry's guilt, it is your duty in the sight of God and man to leave no stone unturned, either to prove him innocent or leave his guilt no longer a matter of doubt at any rate in your own mind. But how am I to do that? asked the young man in great distress. How? Need you ask me? You must know more of your father's affairs than anyone else. You are in a position to form an opinion of his habits, and whether he was likely to have made an enemy or enemies who would resort to the dreadful expedient of slaying him, either from motives of revenge or something else we cannot determine. So much lies in your power, and if you neglect aught, if you tail in the least degree to do what you are bound to do, a curse will rest upon you and yours for all time. Mr. Halesworth spoke in an impassioned way, and as a man might speak who was stricken with a sorrow that was almost beyond human endurance. His words, argument, and manner made a deep and abiding impression on George, and, pondering that night deeply on what had passed, he remembered how, for some little time before his death, his father had behaved strangely. He had received letters that had annoyed him, and it was so obvious to his children that he was grievously troubled that they pressed him for some statement, but he had told them nothing. Then, his strange journey to London and his changed manner, his anxious and haggard face, all pointed to a trouble of some kind that he was anxious to conceal. Here, then, thought the young man, was a mystery that it was his bounden duty to try and solve. After all, it perhaps had no bearing on the murder, but on the other hand it might have. And those two words, might have, were a mandate to George Farnell that he dare not ignore, lest that curse of which Mr. Halesworth spoke should come upon him and his. That night, in the solemn hours, as he lay there pondering, his resolution was taken. Up to this point, the late Mr. Farnell's papers had remained untouched, for the dreadful business had so overwhelmed everybody, especially the sons, that they could do nothing. By the will in the hands of the family lawyer, he, the lawyer, and the two sons were appointed executors. The day following his resolution, therefore, George dispatched an urgent message to the lawyer, a venerable and highly respected gentleman, who valued honor before self-interest, and when he arrived, he and the young man proceeded to go through Mr. Farnell's papers. To men who are not altogether without sentiment, there is no more melancholy duty than that of going through the papers of a deceased friend or relative. They are the written records of schemes, hopes, joys, sorrows, of all the alternating experiences of life. But he who called them forth lies cold in the grave. The busy brain will think no more, the eyes that read are blind forever. The hand that wrote is in the dust. But then there is something even deeper still. A dead man's papers are a dead man's secrets, for there are things that a man keeps even from his nearest and dearest friend, but about which he may have some written record. And so when he is dead, and those who come after him have to rummage among his dusty documents, his folded letters, many of them, it may be, yellow and time-stained, they cannot help feeling that they are opening the dead man's heart, as it were, and reading the secrets written there, and which only death could bring to light. Through the whole of that day, George and the lawyer kept at their task, and when the night was falling, they came across four or five letters tied together with a morsel of twine, and carefully stowed away in a secret drawer in a large, old-fashioned escritoire, that is, secret so long as the owner was living, but was secret no longer now that he had gone down into the dust and those letters were read with astonishment, and with a sense that a fearful revelation was being made. These letters seemed then, in that first reading, destined to clear up the mystery which surrounded the crime. Long and earnestly did the two men discuss what they had brought to light, and then they decided on a plan, which led the lawyer to start off by the first train the following morning for London. Then, guided by what the letters revealed, he drove to a house in the quiet and genteel neighborhood of Balham and inquired for Mrs. Ella Raintree. An old woman, who seemed to be the housekeeper and general servant, informed the lawyer that Mrs. Ella Raintree was seriously ill in bed and could not be seen. But he would take no denial. He insisted on seeing her, and after some difficulty, succeeded in being admitted into the lady's chamber, the pressing nature of the business upon which he had come rendering it impossible that he could observe the formalities and ceremonies of ordinary occasions. Mrs. Ella Raintree was in bed. That she was desperately ill was obvious to the most unpractised eye. In age, she was perhaps a little more than thirty, and at one time must have been remarkably good-looking. But now she was emaciated, blasé, young though she was, with unmistakable evidence in her face of dissipation. 
The lawyer introduced himself, and when he did that, Mrs. Ella Raintree seemed to be seized with some great fear. For two long hours he sat with her, and when he left he felt that he had cut a Gordian knot, or at any rate unraveled a very tangled skein. He got back late that night to Solent View, and late as it was, he remained closeted with George Farnell for two hours before they retired. The following morning he was up early and rode into Lymington, and soon after he arrived there, three constables in plain clothes set off for Solent View, and this indicated that some fresh development of the strange drama was about to take place. When they reached their destination, they found all in the place in a state of excitement, for another tragedy had taken place. In a loft over the stable, Michael Caron was lying dead. He had died by his own hand. He had placed the muzzle of a loaded pistol in his mouth, and pulling the trigger had shattered his head. Was this another mystery? Well, it might have been, but was not. Karen, in giving up his life, doing an act of justice. He put into writing a confession that it was his hand that slew Mr. Farnell, and he did more than this. He gave a detailed statement as to why he had done so dreadful a deed, and he said that the old gun with which he had shot his master he had kept by him for years, for that very purpose, if ever he got confirmation of suspicions he had long entertained. After the murder, he carried the gun some five miles or so, and hid it in a hollow oak tree, and he clearly indicated the spot. He also stated that it was he who had told the bell which had announced Mr. Farnell's doom, but it also announced his own doom. The evil that men do lives after them, and the reason for Karen's crime may be briefly told. This reason was disclosed in those letters which the lawyer and George discovered in the secret drawer of the escritoire. Then it was confirmed and amplified by the lawyer's interview with Mrs. Ella Raintree, who told him all that he wished to know, and it was doubly confirmed by the desperate suicide of Karen, who, suspecting, and suspecting correctly, that the lawyer had solved the mystery and was going to London to see the woman, took his punishment in his own hand, preferring a suicide's end to that at the hands of the executioner. But he stated in his letter of confession that he had resolved to confess before Harry Halesworth was brought up for trial. The story, as told by Karen and confirmed by the lawyer, was sad and terrible, and sullied the honor of Mr. Farnell. Twelve years before this, a young woman had come to Solent View as lady's maid to Mrs. Farnell, who was then living. She bore the unromantic name of Fanny Smith. She was a conspicuously pretty girl, and Michael Karen, in the process of time, fell desperately in love with her, and she apparently returned his love, and it was agreed that they should be married later on. Then Mrs. Farnell died, and pretty Fanny Smith's services were retained for Lydia, who was a young girl. Soon after this, Karen began to feel jealous of his master, though he could never get any reliable evidence to justify that jealousy. The year following Mrs. Farnell's death, Fanny suddenly disappeared. Karen believed that her disappearance was due to his master, who had robbed him of his intended bride, but he could get no proof, though he swore an oath on the Bible that if ever he did get proof, no matter how long after it might be, he would shoot his master. Act the second of this little domestic drama reveals Fanny installed in London, where she was occasionally, and with great caution, repeatedly visited by Mr. Farnell. She became a mother, but when her child was two years old, it died. Then Fanny's nature seemed to change. She slid down the hill rapidly, and for many years Mr. Farnell lost sight of her. What her life was during those years need not be told here. Suddenly, she came to the surface again and wrote to Farnell demanding all sorts of things. She wrote several letters, and at last he went to see her, when she demanded an extravagantly large sum of money and threatened to expose him if he did not give it. He refused, and in a moment of pique, and knowing nothing of Karen's oath, she wrote to him, telling him all. Then the fulfillment of the oath followed, and when Fanny then under the assumed name of Mrs. Ella Raintree, heard of Mr. Farnell's death, and knowing that she had brought it about, she became prostrated with illness, from which she was destined never to recover, for her constitution was shattered. When these facts all came out at the trial of young Houseworth, he was of course acquitted, but the terrible ordeal through which he had passed had so told upon him that his own friends scarcely knew him. Crushed in spirit and broken-hearted about Lydia, he went to Australia, Six years later, Lydia Farnell recovered her reason as suddenly as she had lost it. The fact was announced to Hellsworth by George Farnell himself, for they had kept up a constant correspondence, and Hellsworth, who had been true to his love, returned, and shortly after, he and Lydia were wedded. As gold must be tried in the fire, so the heart must be tried by pain. 
Their hearts had surely been tried by pain, but the reward had come at last. Soon after the winding up of Mr. Farnell's affairs, Solent View, to which George succeeded, was put into the market, but the evil reputation it had acquired so depreciated its value that the owner resolved to keep it until time had purged it. But some years later, owing to the carelessness of an old man and woman who lived in it as caretakers, it was reduced to ashes, and though it was fully insured, George Farnell refused to rebuild it and sold the land. End of story recording by Colleen McMahon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.